So for this video, I will be fully explaining observation hockey, what kind of ambition it is based on, the mechanism through which it works, why it is that you need to remain calm for it to work, and other factors that can get in the way of your ability to use observation, its deep connections to complex concepts both from Taoism and Zen Buddhism, the basis of present sensing, power level sensing, breath sensing, emotion and intention sensing, future sight, and also how Usopp's incredibly long-range observation haki truly works. This is a follow-up to my video on the foundations of haki, so if you haven't, you are advised to watch that first. Firstly, observation, pretty obviously, stems from ambitions of awareness, to know or to be aware of things. Pretty simple, right? But what you wish to be aware of matters. Whether it is to be aware of the presence of enemies, their power, of the true nature of things around you, of the emotions of other creatures, of the future or of the detailed position of an incredibly distant target. This can get even more detailed than that, even in pretty silly ways. For example, I would unironically say that Sanjay's observation is better at sensing women, especially women in distress. But how does this work exactly? What exactly is your haki detecting when you sense something using observation? The idea that everything has chi, that everything has the same essence, was also one that everything was connected, in a way. Let's remember that analogy of the flow of chi that determines the evolution in time of everything as being like a stream of water. If something perturbs this flow, like a stone falling into it, ripples will travel through the water surface. A common analogy is with a spider web. The web connects everything together. Once something is caught in the web, the spider does not need to see it, it merely senses the vibrations in the web. As the key that is used in Haki is the very breath that the voice or mind of the individual stems from, attuning your Haki and with it your voice to these ripples to sense the presence, nature and behavior of things is the essence of observation. So if I'm saying that things generate ripples, through this flowing stream, does that mean ripples or waves through the chi around those things? So for example, if something is surrounded by air, does that mean waves that travel through the air? Isn't that just sound? And does that mean that if there is no chi around, like in empty space, there would be no ripples and therefore no way to sense things with observation? Well, not really. We're dealing with something much more subtle here. Once again, I did say that if the five colors of Haki were to be associated with a system of five phases or elements, it would be Godai from Japanese Buddhism, right? Specifically for observation, the element associated with it would be Void. And here's the case where this association is probably most important out of any of the colors. The Void also referred to as sky, soda, or heaven, is the creative principle that permeates everything. Especially in martial arts, and specifically in martial arts fantasy, connecting with this void allows one to gain awareness of their surroundings in ways that go beyond what is possible with the physical senses, and act without having to think. This is where that notion of the void that I explained in the first Haki video is going to become really important. The fundamental principle of material reality that permeates everything, creates everything, ties everything together, and that ultimately everything is a part of. It is the background of reality, synonymous with the void itself. And we can refer to it also as the Tao, the Way, Emptiness, Akasha, but also as the sky, heaven, Brahman or Musubi. 
First, notice the symbolism to this in the introduction of observation in the series. This happens specifically in the sky island Sorajima Skypea, 10,000 meters above sea level, where even the air itself is sparser. There is also heaven, the ruler of this place is called Kami or God. Here this power is known as Mantra. Mantra. A mantra is a numinous sound in Indian religions such as Hinduism and Buddhism, usually a single syllable thought to carry spiritual meaning and even power. The most well-known and most important mantra is referred to right in the name of one of Anil's priests, Om. Uh... Om is the mantra of the ultimate reality, the highest universal principle, Brahman. Representing the origin and the end of all things, Om is usually uttered as the first syllable in sacred chants and more complex mantras, and often found at the beginning and the end of chapters of Hindu texts such as the Vedas. And yes, I do believe Oda wants to draw this connection here to Brahman, because the guy Zoro fought just before Om was Brahman. But mantra in One Piece is written differently than it normally would. Here it uses the kanji for heart or mind and the kanji for rope. Essentially, mind rope or a rope that connects minds together. Just like mantra here is explained as a listening to others' voices, which we established in the first hockey video to be their minds or sentience. Why rope? Because Remember that we can also refer to this void as musubi from Shinto, which carries the meaning of knot, of tying together. The principle that creates and develops everything, permeates everything and ties everything together. But other than the weird symbolism, what is observation's connection with the void? Well, just like I say that we can think of the evolution of things determined by the flow of qi as a flowing stream of water, I also said when explaining the Tao that we can think of the undifferentiated void, wuji, as a perfectly still surface of water. And just like I say that observation works by sensing those ripples that travel through the water, in this analogy, does the water need to be flowing for the ripples to propagate in it? No, right? The ripples don't need to travel through the flowing qi. Their medium is the very backdrop of reality, it's the void itself. But why is any of this important? Well, to me at least, any kind of power system that includes some form of ability that allows you to sense things without using any of the regular human senses should ideally have a mechanism through which the information travels from the thing being sensed to the one doing the sensing. Some power systems will describe everyone or everything as passively emitting some aura, some will have the user extend their own aura to the object being sensed, etc. In One Piece, because the void itself permeates everything and ties everything together, to sense the presence and nature of things, all you have to do is to become aware of a connection that is already there. But how do you do it? How do you connect with the void and sense those ripples? Of course, to connect with the emptiness of the universe, you must empty your mind, be formless, shapeless, like water. Finally, Luffy did empty his mind and became shapeless like water in Skypea, in this case to counter Enel's observation haki. But profound as Gomu Gomu no Bo may be, I'm talking about something a little deeper. I have mentioned that Taoism, even as far back as the Tao De Jing itself, preached about becoming one with the Tao, or in Naden, the practice to convert Shen, the mind, into Wuji, the undifferentiated void. But just like I had mentioned that Taoism has a much greater focus on metaphysics, on the nature of the world, than Buddhism, 
Buddhism has a much greater focus than Taoism on introspection and the nature of conscious experience. Just like I talked about how this notion of becoming one with the Tao became associated and syncretized with the Buddhist concept of enlightenment, Nirvana, let's see just how many references there are to Buddhist enlightenment in mantra. When entering the land of God, upper yard, Luffy, Usopp and Sanji head through a gate shaped like a Buddha statue. Eno, the antagonist of the arc and the dude that had the greatest mantra, turns into a giant mix of Raijin, the Shinto Kami of Lightning, and Burai, the Laughing Buddha. Eno's arc also has a huge golden Buddha statue face. The names of two of Eno's priests, Satori and Gedatsu, are literally Japanese words for Buddhist enlightenment. The name of another, Shura, is a reference to the Buddhist and Hindu Ashuras. The name of the commander of his divine soldiers, Yama, is the name of the Buddhist god of the underworld, known in Japan as Himma. The chapter when mantra is first displayed is chapter 246, named Satori, priest of the Mayoi forest. Mayoi means hesitation, doubt, or losing your way, which is why it is translated as wandering forest or forest of no return. Yet it is also a Buddhist term meaning inability to reach enlightenment. The cover of the chapter has Luffy practicing Zen Buddhist style meditation among lotus flowers, an important symbol of the Buddha. Satori in this chapter, who introduces mantra, is also introduced in the same pose of Zen style meditation. There are so many of the symbols, I probably miss some. But an important one to pay attention to is the symbolism of the moon. Eno claims his people came from the moon. The moon is the true residence of God, the sacred land that he sought. His ultimate goal in the Ark, which he actually accomplishes, is going to the moon. And remember the one ability I mentioned in the Nature Haki video that involves interacting with the void? Specifically kicking it or walking on it. Right, one of the six powers, Gepo, meaning moon step. In Mahayana Buddhism, which Zen is a part of, the teachings are often compared to a finger pointing towards the moon. The finger should not be the object of focus of the student, it merely points towards the moon, which symbolizes true enlightenment. Don't think, feel. It is like a finger pointing away to the moon. Don't concentrate on the finger or you will miss all that heavenly glory. The moon specifically is a recurrent symbol in Mahayana of what is known as Buddha nature. Buddha nature is an idea important to Mahayana that every sentient creature possesses a pure essence of the Buddha inside them, that this Buddha nature is in fact the true self of every sentient creature that merely needs to be acknowledged and cleansed of defilements. Buddha nature is compared to the moon covered by clouds. The moon is always shining, even though it might be hidden by the clouds, representing the afflictions. This metaphor is referenced in the Nolan Kalgara flashback. The city of gold, Chandra, named after Chandra, the Sanskrit name for the moon and the Hindu god that personified it, is shot into the sky and into the island clouds, the clouds keeping it hidden from view as if it never existed, resulting in Nolan being called a liar. The name of the chapter in which it happens mentions the moon hidden by clouds, also serving as a complex reference to a poem by Kakinomoto no Hitomaru, lamenting not being able to meet a person you want to meet. Buddha nature is also known as the Tathagatagarbha, the Buddha embryo. It's the reason why, as I mentioned in the Nature Haki video, Taoist Nathan practices for achieving immortality started to be visualized as cultivating an embryo in the lower dantian, when they mixed with Buddhist ideas of nirvana. The creation of the young body was related to the cultivation of the Buddha embryo. Though central to Mahayana, Buddha nature is historically and to this day a controversial idea in Buddhism. That is because an incredibly central concept in Buddhism directly coming from the teachings of the historical Buddha is anatta or non-self. It rejects the idea that there is such a thing as an inherent unchanging self or soul that is the true essence of an individual. To Buddhists, the true nature of everything is sunyata, emptiness. And though this emptiness is referred to in Chinese and Japanese by the same word used for the void, it refers to a 
different sort of emptiness. To Buddhism, a central idea is dependent arising. That is, that all phenomena exist in dependence to other phenomena. That nothing can exist by itself. And so that all things are in reality devoid of an intrinsic existence and nature. Many Buddhists would argue that Buddha nature is a concept of true inherent self that is incompatible with anatta and that was smuggled into Buddhism from other traditions. But its proponents would argue that this inherent Buddha nature is actually non-self. A prominent example of this is found in the Wu or Mu Koan. Koans are short dialogues presented to the students of Zen, generally with complex and seemingly paradoxical or even nonsensical ideas, meant to evoke confusion and reflection on the listener or reader so that they will find enlightenment themselves in trying to understand them. In the most well-known version of the Mu Koan, a monk asks the teacher Chao Chu Tsungshen if dogs have Buddha nature. You see, the Buddhists do not wonder if the Buddha has that dog in him, but whether the dog has that Buddha in him. By the way, Chao Chu is known in Japan as Joshu, and this koan, also known as Chao Chu's dog, likely inspired the name of Shushu, the dog, officially romanized as Chao Chu. Just like the koan is about a dog having Buddha nature, which is supposed to be the key to liberation from suffering and the cycle of rebirth, Cho Cho swallows the key to Luffy's liberation from the cage he's trapped in. And so I also suspect that Ohm's dog in Skypiea, Holy, being so similar looking to Cho Cho is intentional. Anyways, in the koan, Chao Cho responds to the question of dogs having Buddha nature simply with Mu or Wu in the original Chinese. Mu literally means nothing or without. It's the same Wu we see in Wuji, for example. So on the surface, it seems like Chao Chu is denying dogs having Buddha nature, which would go against the central idea of Buddha nature, which is every being having it. Does the confusion the koan causes. Yet Mu is an incredibly important concept in Zen, represented in Japanese Zen's most prominent symbol, the Enso or circular form. It symbolizes Mu as the void, as emptiness, but also the universe itself and absolute enlightenment. Notice how Satori's entire design is based on this circular form, from his clothes, glasses, the very shape of his body and the trial he presides over, the trial of balls. Chao Cho responding with Mu is not so much a denial of dogs having Buddha nature. The question of something having Buddha nature or not is one that perhaps doesn't make a lot of sense because Zen specifically describes Buddha nature as emptiness, as Mu. Rather than a personal, immutable self, Buddha nature is emptiness of the mind. It's the background, the canvas on which all conscious experience takes place, what is left when we remove everything else. It's frequently equated to the concept of the luminous mind, which is probably why the metaphor of the shiny moon is so prevalent. It is luminous because anything that appears on it is immediately illuminated becomes part of awareness. When all cravings, aversions, judgments, delusions are removed, all that is left is the equanimous pure awareness. Just like I say, the Taoists were more concerned with the nature of the universe and to them, the basic principle of nature, the background of reality, was the emptiness of the Tao. To Zen Buddhists, Concerned with the nature of conscious experience, the basic nature of consciousness, the background on which all experience takes place, is the emptiness of Buddha nature. Some East Asian Buddhist thinkers, such as Jizang, would actually say that Buddha nature is present not only in every sentient being, but in the whole cosmos, equating it with the Tao and thus equating the emptiness of the mind with the emptiness of the universe. So Buddha nature is so important to observation Haki because to cultivate it, to cultivate the emptiness of the mind, is to cultivate pure awareness and to attune your conscious awareness to the void that permeates all of reality and connects everything. To cultivate this emptiness, to cultivate Buddha nature, is to cleanse the mind of defilements. That's why for observation to work, it's paramount to remain calm and to attain a state of mindfulness in general. 
When your mind gets muddied with distractions, doubt, anger, attachment, desire, observation is not possible. So to sense the ripples created by something else is on its most basic level to sense its presence. What the user's own haki will naturally be more attuned to and thus more likely to sense is the haki or ki of others. No wonder then that this present sensing allows you foremost to detect the presence of people and animals, to see people's auras and thus to also see their usage of haki when it would normally be invisible. Of course, the size, the intensity of those ripples is foremost determined by the strength of the key that is causing them. So, of course, one of the other uses of observation is to sense the power of individuals. By the way, this is pretty much identical to what Fukuro does when he measures the Dori key of the CP9 agents, which he labels as being part of Rokushiki, again pointing towards Rokushiki using Haki. But while an individual's haki is normally more attuned to the vital key or vital breath of others, it becomes more attuned to the breath of non-sentient things when the individual is close to death. Yes, though I have said that the use of the breath of things, including both the ability to cut specific things or to control them, is utilizing a completely separate fourth color of haki that I have labeled nature or breath haki, sensing the breath of things is a form of observation haki, and essentially equivalent to sensing the presence of living creatures. As I mentioned in the nature haki video, notice that what the individual is attempting to control during their near-death experience determines what kind of breath they learn. Because of course, the things you sense with observation depends on what you have a will to sense. Which is why, for example, Zoro only becomes aware of the breath of things during his fight with Mr. One. When he's specifically trying to understand the nature of things, to try to find the secret to cutting them. Even though we know from his inner monologue here, that he's had near-death experiences, much like this one, in the past. Notice here that despite the difficulty of the situation, when Zoro senses the breath of things, he is calm and in a state of contemplation. During Luffy's fight with Katakuri, Luffy remembers his training in observation haki with Rayleigh. In it, Luffy wonders if a feeling he had was observation or just his imagination. Rayleigh stops Luffy in his tracks and says that imagination is just fine. That it is by extension of just imagination that the color of observation is found. Of course, observation is deeper than just imagination, we're talking about the pure awareness, the background of consciousness, yet really drawing the connection to imagination can be elucidating in more than one way. When we imagine something, we reflect on something that is not being picked up by our senses, yet we use the same mental tools that our senses do. We often think of thoughts almost as hearing a voice speaking them aloud in our heads, that is, inner monologue. We often imagine objects by visualizing them in our minds, seeing their form, color, perhaps even picturing its sense to the touch, smell or taste. This is what is referred to as a mental image, and the capacity to see imagined things in our minds is often referred to as the mind's eye. So, if observation works as an extension of imagination, it should work in a similar way, in that though the information that it detects is not being picked up by our regular senses of vision, hearing, etc., the way we mentally perceive this information would be very similar, using the same tools as those senses through the mind's eye. In that way, it almost works as an extension of our regular senses. So when Usopp uses observation, even though that information is not being captured by his regular eyesight, he does see the aura much like he would see anything else. When users of observation in general see someone using armament hardening, even if that hardening is likely invisible to the naked eye, they are likely seeing it like the black coating we as readers see. Or when users hear the thoughts of others, they hear it much like voices in their heads. Or like Zoro notices the breath of things, almost like hearing a physical breathing that is distinct for each thing. 
Of course, the different ways that things behave, the different ways that chi flows, results in different signals and different ripples. Just like the difference between things can be determined from the difference in the way their breath feels or sounds to observation, people's feelings and intentions will result in different signals, and a user particularly attuned to the emotions of other beings is able to sense them with observation. According to Rayleigh, Luffy has such a disposition, meaning Luffy has a will to be aware of the feelings of others. And of course this would be the case, because through the whole series, we have seen this will reflected as Luffy's sense of empathy. This ability is not something that cannot be countered, though. Much like people can keep their emotions from surfacing, especially, say, great actors who essentially become the part that they are playing, the fake emotions they embody can affect the very presence that they emanate, and fool even observation users capable of sensing people's feelings. Pudding had both Luffy and Sanji fooled, though she probably had herself fooled internally as well, given how conflicting her emotions could be. Kanjuro had Odin and the other scabbards fooled for years. According to Rayleigh, the emotions you can sense like this include intentions, like the intention behind an attack and that by sensing their intentions, you can predict your opponent's moves. We have seen this demonstrated in the very introduction to Mantra by Satori. Funny thing is, Satori, other than meaning enlightenment, is also the name of a monkey yokai from Japanese folklore that can read minds. And my reading is kinda what this is. Satori was able to tell that Luffy could stretch before he did, because Luffy had the intention to stretch. Likewise, Eno could not predict Luffy's moves in Gomu Gomu no Bo form because there was no intention to them, and he could not tell where Luffy's punches rebound from a wall were going to land, because Luffy himself didn't know where they were going to land. And so, though people confuse this ability with future sight, they are very distinct things. When it comes to future sight, it's not just about sensing people's intentions. For one, a user of future sight distinctively visualizes what will happen in the future, other than just sensing what the opponent intends to do. And they don't just visualize the action itself, but the consequences of said action within the near future. But more than that, they can predict an individual's actions before the individual in question even had any intention of performing said action. During Sanji's marriage ceremony with Pudding, Katakuri saw that Pudding was going to collapse. Yet Pudding at the time still had no intention of collapsing. After Katakuri makes his prediction, Pudding lifts her veil to reveal her third eye, thinking Sanji would think it looks hideous. Sanji sees her eye, says that it is beautiful, Pudding is surprised and disarmed by Sanji's comment, and then collapses, crying, thinking about her past. Katakuri didn't just sense Pudding's intentions at that moment, rather, he was able to see the final outcome of this whole sequence of events. So what is it that allows this ability? Firstly, sensing people's emotions, including their intentions, is absolutely a part of it. It is precisely as Luffy is trying to learn future sight during his fight with Katakuri that we flash back to his training with Rayleigh, in which Rayleigh talks about how there is a presence, a hint, to every attack and that predicting someone's moves requires sensing their intentions. But then, as the conversation continues, Rayleigh mentions the ability to see the future, and asks Luffy what he would do if he were to face an opponent with this ability. Luffy responds by saying that it depends on what type of person they are, that their personality is something that you have to take into account. And this, in itself, is another huge hint to the essence of future sight. To predict the future, seeing actions that an individual will take that they themselves don't know yet that they will be taking, you have to know how they will react to different situations and where their thought process will go from where it's at at a given moment. That is, you have to know their personality. A big thing throughout Luffy's fight with Katakuri is the mutual respect and especially mutual understanding that they develop. Luffy comes to understand Katakuri and his need to hide any imperfections or anything that would look like a weakness. And throughout the fight, he deliberately shows Katakuri the value in just honestly expressing yourself. 
Even so, when the fight has ended, he covers Katakuri's mouth with one of his hats. He understands why Katakuri feels the need to cover it and respects his decision, even if he disagrees with it. Katakuri comes to understand not only Luffy's potential, but also why he behaves in the very honest and straightforward way he does. And also that Luffy continuing to rise in power and eventually bringing down Big Mom would be ultimately what is best for his family. This importance of understanding the personality of others for future sight is further emphasized when Katakuri asks if Brule can see the future too, when she correctly predicts that he would be glad to know Luffy escaped. It's not really observation Haki, it's just that she knows him better than anyone else. Even Kaido, another user of future sight, as brutish as he is, shows legitimate interest in Luffy during their fight not only as an opponent, but as an individual, being curious even as to what kind of world Luffy wished to create. But okay, suppose you can accurately sense your surroundings, including living creatures, the emotions of other individuals, you can even form an accurate picture of their personality. How do you get from this accurate picture of the present to an accurate picture of the future? Well, remember that the flow of chi determines the evolution in time of everything. So, if you have formed an accurate picture of the chi around you, including the living creatures whose behavior you're trying to predict, if you can see how that chi will flow, you can determine what will happen in the near future. This could perhaps be thought as flowing that mental image that you have of the chi around you inside your own mind to see how it will evolve in the future. And of course, this ability in itself is dependent on a certain kind of will. And here is the final ingredient. The ability to see the future based on your current picture of the present comes, of course, from your will to see the future. It makes so much sense for Luffy to develop this ability, not only because he has a will to be aware of others' feelings, not only because he has a will to be aware of their personalities, but also because he has always been looking forward to the future. Though for different reasons, Katakuri also had this will to be aware of the future. In his case, to always be several steps ahead of anyone that could harm his family. Now, before I move on, let me just point out the symbolism to Buddha nature, as I talked about before, in Katakuri. Much like Buddha nature is something realized by cleansing it of defilements, Katakuri is specifically described as the perfect man, flawless, always calm and stoic. His devil fruit power, Mochi, is very tied in Japanese culture to the moon, due to the myth of the rabbit who pounds Mochi on the moon. Notice how Luffy's fight with Katakuri starts with Carrot attacking him in a fit of rage after Pedro's death. The Mochi in question was built different though, so Luffy had to step up and do the pounding for the moon rabbit, kind of like Discover from chapter 22. Luffy's fight with Katakuri happens during a full moon night, simultaneously with the Sulung reveal. The circular form, Enso, symbolizing emptiness and enlightenment, is referenced in Katakuri's obsession with donuts. And even Chaocho's dog might have gotten a reference, with Katakuri being the Japanese name for the dog tooth lily and a dog being in the cover of the chapter he first appears on. Also, another common Zen metaphor for the realized Buddha nature is a bright mirror, in that it perfectly reflects what is presented to it. Katakuri is a mirror image of Luffy and their fight takes place in the mirror world. Sensing presence, sensing auras, this would otherwise be some of the most basic usage of observation Haki, right? But what stands out when Usopp snipes sugar is the sheer distance between Usopp and what he's sensing. According to Kinemon, the castle itself was barely even visible to the naked eye. Luffy, Law and Sugar are inside the outer walls of the castle in the courtyard 
behind a wall. And yet Usopp can see them in detail when using observation hockey. Because so clearly, Usopp has some incredible observation hockey that allows him to be aware of stuff happening kilometers of him. Or so I'm told by a lot of people mainly saying this to push their agendas. But the fact is, there's no canon evidence of Usopp having even the most basic observation hockey use of detecting unseen enemies who are close by even after this event. When he's in Zoe, walking with Zoro, Robin, Frankie and Law, and Carrot is hiding in the forest waiting to attack them, Usopp doesn't detect her presence at all. Only Zoro and Law do. Even after Usopp has seen that they have detected something, he still can't sense anything and has to rely on them. Now firstly, let's point out how Usopp's mentality plays a major role in his observation or lack of thereof in these scenes. In this scene in Zoe, Usopp is scared, he is not calm, his mind is clouded by doubts. Which in fact impedes not only his ability to use observation, but Haki in general. When he shoots Sugar, he has no doubts about what he has to do. He's determined to act, he's calm, concentrated, in fact, he's the one keeping Viola from getting distracted. No wonder it's in this situation that he awakens observation. And again, I will stress, what your will is to be aware of matters. Usopp's mind here has single point concentration on his target, while disregarding completely what is happening around him, including the violent mob of people coming to capture him. It's this concentration this focus that allows Usopp's observation to zoom in so far and in such great detail on his target. Usopp's long-range observation does not work like a multi-kilometer radar that allows him to sense everything happening in this immense radius around him. He needs a target to focus on. It works fittingly very much like a sniper scope. In fact, we had likely already seen this ability used way back in chapter 222 when Van Auger uses it to snipe seagulls that were beyond the horizon. Which is also why it makes no fucking sense to say the straw hats don't need a lookout because Usopp's observation can see kilometers away. The ability doesn't work like that, it's not meant for spotting things in the first place. Now conveniently, there is one individual for whom the themes of observation, namely its ties to Buddha nature, enlightenment, the sky or void, the moon, etc. would fit very well, and could certainly use observation for their job on the crew. Damn, I wonder who that is. The people who have been subscribed to this channel for a while know very well what I'm talking about. Anyways, next video will be about conquerors or supreme king Haki the basics of how it works, what kind of ambition it's tied to, and so what makes someone a supreme king, and I will use this to explain what I think of the chances of the probably most popular choices in the community for future users of Supreme King Haki, Usopp and Sanji. I'll explain not only the basic powers of intimidation, taming animals, making people pass out, but also delve a little bit deeper into the type of conqueror's haki that Imu uses against devil fruit users, go into Shanks's observation killing haki, into the making of cursed blades, explain conqueror's pressure, as in how conqueror's haki is able to exert physical force on objects, and also I'll finally explain the true nature of Zoro's Ashura. For this video, that's it. Ciao.